think of classic makeup brands, skincare brands that have been around for a while, I bet one of the names that comes to mind is Estee Lauder. But you may not know, was Estee Lauder a real person? Who owns the company now? Hello, my name is Stacy, and this is Stacy Lee Beauty. Estee Lauder is not her real name. She was born Josephine Esther Menser in Queens. Now her uncle, who was a chemist, came to the U.S. in 1900. By 1925, he had established New Way Laboratories in New York. And it is there where SD appears to have been introduced into the manufacturing side of cosmetics and really got her interest peaked into the whole industry. And it's interesting that the New, Lab, New Way Laboratories, they produced a whole wide variety of products from poultry remedies to cosmetics and toiletries, so quite the range. Now, by 1930, the company had changed its name to New Way Laboratories, and it was advertising its services as a private label manufacturer. There is a biography book out about Estee Lauder, but she's very it's very vague on the early beginnings of her life and especially her work between 1925 and 1945. It just really kind of skips over that range. It suggests that she traveled a lot between New York and Florida, making sales for the company wherever she could. It's also hard to find when she actually changed her name officially to Estee Lauder. So I'm just going to refer to her in this whole video as Estee. In 1930, she got married to Joseph Lauder, their first child in 1933. And in 1939, they got divorced, which, whoa, can you imagine what's that, what big a deal that must have been in the 1939s that anybody was getting a divorce? I bet that was scandalous. Um, so but in 1943, they actually reconciled, remarried, and had their second child in 1944. Now, some people said that in between the time before when they got divorced to when they reconcile, that they think maybe she changed her name to Lauder instead of Lauder to kind of distinguish herself from Joseph. After they got back together, they... Joseph took over the manufacturing side of the business and she took over the sales, going on the road and traveling. So Estee Lauder Cosmetics was officially launched in 1946. At this time, the brand had a limited edition of skincare and it was currently sold only at two hairdressing salons at the time. They were packaged in white opal glass jars with black lids. They just put stick-on labels on each of the products. They spent their own money on it because at the time, they could not get any agency to give them money because their advertising budget was so small in the realm of things. So all the agencies were like, mm, not big enough for us, no thanks. They spent money on samples, gave it away at fashion shows, gave it away in mailings just to get the word out. I found this interesting too, that they repurposed a restaurant into a factory in Manhattan. During the day, she would sell the products. And then at night, she would go to the kitchen area and cook up the creams and her products on the restaurant stoves at night. 1947, just a year later, she got her big break and she got a counter at Saks Fifth Avenue. And the order that she got was equivalent to $10,000 today. This time, the containers were no longer white, they were blue. This became known as the Estee Lauder Blue. She went on to, of course, introducing more products, more eyeshadows, a cream rouge, it came in one shade turquoise for the eyeshadow. A cream-based face powder was launched it's called Honey Glow, or known sometimes as fat powders because they had a little bit of fat or oil mixed in to help the powder stick to the skin. So with that being in mind, her products were mostly for dry skin women. At this time, it wasn't marketed that way, but that's what it was known to be the best for. By 1951, she had expanded into more department stores all across the U.S. The department stores, they believed in her, saw the sales, 
that they would let their customers issue a line of credit in the store to be able to buy Estee Lauder products. Estee convinced them to let Estee Lauder use the mailing list that the store had for the customers and their credit cards to send them a card, which then when they got the card in the mail, then if they came into the department store to the Estee Lauder counter, they could get a free gift. So ta-da, free gifts was born. Of course, we still have gift with purchases being very popular. So if you're interested in how you can know when the gift with purchases are so you don't miss them, signing up for their newsletter, that way you can be emailed. Now down in the description box, I will have the different stores that Estee Lauder is sold. So I would recommend if you're interested in what the gift with purchase will be, go to each of those, whatever store you order from or that you're near because they're different with each store. It's not that they have gift with purchase, like this is gonna be the bag and the products that you're gonna get. It really was ahead of her time because in the 1950s, when it came to fragrance, a woman didn't usually buy herself fragrance. She waited for her husband to buy her a perfume for an anniversary, a birthday, you know, a very special occasion. Well, she didn't really like that. I mean, that's nice and all, but she wanted it to be where a woman could buy her own perfume if she wanted to, and she could get it as a gift, but she didn't have to wait. So in 1953, she created Youth Dew, which was a bath oil that doubled as a skin perfume. It retailed in 1953 for $8.50 a bottle. This was something brand new to the cosmetics and the fragrance market. The sales reached a volume of 5,000 a week in the mid-1950s, 5,000. Now, what are some Estee Lauder perfumes? When I first set out to do this video, I thought, okay, I'll go through and research. Oh no, I mean, list them out, no. There is so many fragrances. So I'm just gonna go over a couple. You can search on her website, like if you want fresh and fruity or musky. If you didn't know, private collection, that fragrance, I found the inspiration to that interesting. So in her private office, Mrs. Lauder kept a collection of rare fragrance essentials. She created a perfume from these precious ingredients that was deeply personal to herself alone. So that is what the story is behind the private collection fragrance. And on the website, they all go over the notes and some of them do give the inspiration either for the scents themselves or for the bottles. So that is kind of interesting too. If you have a favorite one, you know, to go in there and see what it was inspired by. If they say that, what is your favorite fragrance? Either Estee Lauder or not. Like what is your go-to fragrance? Right now I am loving Carolina Herrera. It's the shoe. You can actually purchase the original, the youth do in the original bottle if you want. In the 1960s, they had black and white photo ads, but it wasn't because they were trying to be all artsy and different. It is actually just, it was simple. They couldn't afford color. So they did black and white. 1964, she introduced a male fragrance. In 1967, they launched a 24 karat gold, oh. golden alligator refillable compact. It's still sold today. Every year they introduce new designs. There are currently more than 1,700 compacts in the company's archives. Very cool. And they are quite pricey, but they are very cool. I did not know this, okay? Let me know if you know this about Clinique. Did you know, I mean, at the malls, you know, you saw Clinique, you saw Estee Lauder, but did you know that Clinique was actually came from Estee Lauder. I did not know that. I thought like it was just a whole separate brand, but no, Estee Lauder introduced Clinique in 1968. And I did not know it had been around that long. The goal that they wanted with Clinique was to show a image of well-researched and medically sound products that were produced in laboratories. The first 20 salespeople were given titles of consultants, which I believe that they still are. And that kind of makes sense now when you, like if you go to Ulta and you go over to the Clinique area, the sales associates, consultants, you know, have that white kind of lab coat on. 
And now it's like, oh yeah, that's why, because that's like the essence of the brand when it started is that, hey, these are medically researched, you know, lab made products. In 1973 is when SD decided to reduce her role in the company's day-to-day. -day. She resigned as president, stepped down on the board, uh, but stayed as chairman on the board. And then her oldest son, Leonardo, he took over running the company. The line prescriptives, did not know this either. It was introduced in 1979, promoted as a more high-tech line. One-hour makeup and fashion consultants were really part of the program. It really it kind of had lukewarm reception. The company regrouped and they revised their approach to it. In 1982, she created the first night serum with called Night Repair. The first to use that brown bottle style that was helping to protect the formula's active ingredients. It was the first one to do that. Fortunately, her husband did pass away in 1983. In 1990, we have a, another division was formed, this time Origins. This was marketed as the botanical treatment line. It was designed to appeal to the environmentally conscious consumer. The makeup shades were natural skin tone. Petroleum-based active ingredients were not used in it. Now in 1993, they decided to, instead of creating a new division, they wanted to get involved with licensing. So they entered into a licensing agreement with Tommy Hilfiger. Two years later, they launched Tommy Fragrance for Men and then followed with Tommy Girl. In the late, in the mid nineties, we get into some acquiring instead of making their own separate lines. So in 1995, they acquired Mac now, at first it was just a majority, but by 1998, they had gained full control of the company. Same year, 1995, they acquired Bobby Brown. That same year, that was a big year for them. <laughs> they went public that November. And at the time, the company, so that was again in 1995, they were valued at around $2 billion, with a B, dollars. In 1996, they were getting into the internet and the brands that were first to the e-commerce market was Clinique and Bobby Brown. And by 1999, all of their brands had their own website. Sadly, on April 24th, 2004, SD died at the age of 97. Her son, Leonardo, took over and the grandson, William, he is the executive chairman and two granddaughters hold senior positions. So that's nice that the family is still involved. I never know kind of what direction a brand history video is gonna take until I start to research it. Like sometimes what you can find is very product heavy as far as like this was introduced this year, that year, that year. And sometimes it's acquisition heavy, which seems to be the case in Estee Lauder. In 2020, 2010, they acquired Smashbox, 2016, Too Faced, 2019, they acquired Dr. Jart Skincare. So that is just kind of a highlight of the brands that they've acquired. They own a lot. <laughs> Fortunately, they are not cruelty free. Uh, that means that they do sell on the shelves in mainland China. Now you can purchase the Estee Lauder products on a variety of websites in a variety of stores. Interested in learning a specific ingredient that comes in their product on their site, you can scroll to the very bottom of the website and there's an ingredient glossary. Now, one of the companies that is under the Estee Lauder umbrella that has quite a different story to it is Too Faced. And there was a lot of scandal in that video. If you want to check out that one right here, click on it. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you next time. Bye.